and we're going to talk a little bit about sex. And in particular, we're going to talk about some of the evolutionary lens through which one might view sex. Let's start with the basic. Is it better to be a man or a woman? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. Better it, to be... It is, it is neither better to be male nor female in any population that is experiencing sex ratios, the likes of which every population that we know of, with exceedingly rare exceptions, have experienced throughout history. Yes, but you evaded the question I asked you, man or woman? <laughs> I've always enjoyed being female. You've always enjoyed being I've female. I've always enjoyed you being male. I see, yep. yes. Um, well, Being straight and all. And it is a mathematical inevitability that either sex, which is limiting, which there are not enough, will be produced in greater numbers the next generation because they will be the more valuable one. Yes, and that so, sounds very technical. But in the case of men and women, is it not clear that it is better to be a man because if you play your cards right, you get to go to bed with women? Ah, see, now that said, said like a straight man. My Very feeling, much so. My feeling is, as you might imagine, the corollary, which is that um, not really even having to play your cards, right? Uh, you get to engage with, with men sexually, but if you play your cards right, you get to go to bed, as you say, with excellent Yes, I see. That's all very confusing. I can't imagine why anyone would want to do it. Is it not obvious that it is better to be male because in most species, males can produce huge numbers of offspring and females, because they invest more in each offspring, produce smaller numbers? So evolution being what it is and it having something to do with producing large numbers of offspring, isn't it evolutionarily better to be male? No, because every man imagines that he's that guy that he's going to be the Genghis Khan of his generation and produce more kids than anyone else ever has. And of course, no modern man is thinking in terms of production of kids, but the proxy is, I'm going to have a lot of sex. I'm going to have a lot of sex with a lot of women, maybe settling down, but also keeping my eye out for all the other sexual opportunities that are out there. Most men aren't that guy. And so in a population in which there is a Genghis Khan, there are many, many men. <laughs> there are many. God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm getting a late start at it. That's for sure. We could agree that as Genghis Khan's go, I'm not a, a you know an early bloomer. Well, can we can we agree that you're going to keep your eyes on the prize that is our children that are already extant in the universe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're my first priority for sure. Okay. Um, in a population where Genghis Khan exists, there are going to be a ton of men who are involuntarily celibate. Whereas in any population across human history, and indeed across the broad swath of other organisms, all females end up reproducing. And so the variation, the variability in what is called reproductive success for females is far lower than the variability in reproductive success for males. And in fact, we see that greater male variability hypothesis borne out in a number of other areas in terms of things like mathematical ability as well. But in terms of reproductive success, the male who has reproduced the most has had far more kids than, than any woman could. And certainly there are some women who have had no children and uh, some men who have had no children, so it would appear that the lower limit is just the same, and while the number is the same, zero. The number of men throughout history who have left no offspring is an order of magnitude higher than the, than the percentage of women in any given population who leave no offspring. So if we imagine that the average man sits at some position in terms of number of offspring that he leaves at any given moment in history. For everyone who beats the odds, there's one who underperforms. Is that fair to say? Exactly. And so the same thing is true for females. Because it takes a male and a female to produce offspring in creatures like us, um, there, are, there is an equal average in the population for the number of offspring produced but the variance is much greater for males. Quite so. So uh, in any population where polygyny, often more generically and slightly less precisely called polygamy, in any population where polygamy is a norm, there will be more women than men reproducing in the population. 
But that does not change the fact that every single one of us, barring gross cases of incest, have an exactly equal number of male and female ancestors. Okay, so in a case, let's say it's human beings, and there's been a war that has eliminated a large number of men from a population. Is it now better to be male or female? Better in terms of that, like that, that moment in time? If you were a parent producing offspring, would it be better to produce male offspring or female offspring at that instant? Well, actually, the answer is the same. Uh, in the moment, uh, you are going to produce more kids if you're male because you are, males are limiting. Therefore, you are a rare commodity. And into the next generation, especially if you can produce kids quickly, that is likely to be the case uh, in, until it corrects. And so boys are, for the moment, going to be more valuable and therefore produced in greater numbers. So... And the inverse would also be true. The, in the case where, for instance, there has been a lot of sex-selective abortion, as is true in some cultures, women are limiting, and therefore women become more valuable and, uh, and have greater choice among partners when they come of age. Which I must say raises a deep question that I've never heard well answered, and I'm afraid the answer is actually quite frightening. But in a culture where uh, women are less common because of selective abortion, you should imagine that women would be in high demand and therefore they should be prized as offspring. And yet that is not typically what we understand from such cultures. So that's a mystery that we have to address separately. Cultural it, norms don't change as quickly as we think they should be able to. I actually don't think that cuts it. Oh, I don't, no. I don't think it's full, fully explanatory, but it's true. I think that, that is an observation without being particularly explanatory. I think there is something about the fact that the cultural norm, which obviously could turn on a dime, does not shift in the direction of female offspring that suggests that actually an overproduction of male offspring has a value that we have yet to describe. Well, we've been talking about, uh, about adaptive value at the individual level, and a population will be better suited to something like warfare if it has an overproduction of men. Yeah, but our field has yet to acknowledge that that level of selection exists. And so in, in some sense, I think we are upended here by the fact that we don't have the right tools yet. But so let's, let's just finish out the general biological case. It is not better to be male or female because although the variance is higher for males and therefore a super successful male is better than a super successful female from the perspective of how many offspring he produces, the chances of underperforming counteract the value of overperforming so that males and females end up dead even. The logic to walk away from this with is, from the point of view of producing offspring, males and females in a population in which males and females are equally common are equally valuable. There are reasons that an individual might want to produce males or females if that individual knows something about what sorts of offspring it's going to produce. But absent that information, males and females are equally valuable. In a population in which Either males or females have become rare, producing the rare sex has disproportionate value. And so there are moments in time at which the logic does not hold for a given population and being one or the other is better. But um, there is not a bias in terms of which sex ought to be better. In other words, it's whatever sex happens to be in short supply. That may be males because males are risk takers. It may be more frequent that males are in low supply and therefore producing males will have a, an extra benefit for the parents who do it. But in general, it's a matter of which sex has become rare. Right. Historically, the risks to males have been things like hunting and warfare. And the risks to females have been, in humans, childbirth. Hunting, warfare, and anything that follows, hold my beer Indeed. or watch this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's a biggie for men. Sometimes for boys, look ma no hands. Look ma no hands mm -hmm. or hold my root beer also. Yes, that one true. sometimes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think this is a good uh, introductory lesson in terms of how to think about sex from an evolutionary perspective.